can't sing that one. You know, that yeah. one don't, don't flow well. Yeah. This will cool. It's up there. It's an open invitation. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. The pizza. Yeah. Good morning, y'all. Welcome to Hobbs Island Church. Miss Kelly. Morning. Morning. Face the front. Glad, glad to see all y'all. Um, got just a couple things tonight. We'll have live group at five. The Vision Farm. You turn towards the race. Go down towards the racetrack. It's on the right, crossing the racetrack. We'll see you now. So we'll be there at five. Um, just to say, pork chops. Mm -hmm. it's actually, we're finally found pot roast. Okay, so we're back to pot so roast. Pot roast. We're back to pot roast. Okay. Nice Jesse, you, you don't know what's going on. So. Yes. Pot roast. So what? Are, hey, y'all know what goes with pot roast? Cornbread. Cornbread. Yeah. <laughs> Andrea's out of town, so she can't make cornbread, and I can't make cornbread. So if y'all, whatever y'all want to bring to go with that, um, drinks and that kind of stuff, I know we'll have a good time. Actually, I was over there Friday night, and it's just nice and peaceful out there, and it's a good little place to hang out. And it's going to be nice. Where is it? Is it on the lower level or is it going yeah. up the hill? When you turn on Higgy Burra, you cross the railroad track, and it's right there on the right. Oh, yeah. where the wedding was. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, but sure. there's little farm animals and a little pavilion. Yes. You can just pull through those gates and park at that little building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. We'll hang out there tonight starting at 5. So, um, and we've, Jesse and I have tossed around the idea of having a Sunday night prayer time. Mm -hmm. We haven't finalized anything on that. But Miss Gail brought up something to me on Wednesday night, one Wednesday night about praying and praying together in prayer. So I've got this little book. I'm starting to put prayer requests in. If you have prayer requests that we need to pray for as a church, come to me and I'll write these down in my book and we will pray for these on Sunday, Wednesday night, life group, whenever we meet, we'll pray for these folks and also pray for our country because we're in a time where we're always in a time where we need prayer, but we're really in a time where we need prayer now. So we're going to put more emphasis on prayer and that type of thing. So if you have something special, I've got uh, I've got Miss Gail and uh, 
<coughs> her friend Connie in here already, and a couple of things that she was doing. <coughs> so y'all come to me with those. Um, we got anything else? That's about it, man. Okay, Jesse said I'm talking to us. So. You done talking to us? Yeah. <laughs> you got any? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> with regard to the prayer time, my uh, in my in my just conversation with God, I sought some uh, insight as to what would be best from not just from a pastor's perspective, but for the whole church. Um, historically, in in uh, church life, things change for the better when we really empty ourselves of our own dependence on self. Not forgetting what we know, what we've learned, but engaging with God, the God we know, the God we have learned to love, and saying, if you don't come through on what we're asking for, we have no hope. We, we, won't, we won't see it. It won't be done. And I really believe that the spiritual malaise and sleep of this nation and this region can be pierced through first by laying it out in prayer, and that will change our hearts toward the uh, people around us. The thing that people need from Hobbs Island Church the most is not just physical assistance, but we wouldn't come short of that. And it's not just, um, you know, a community presence, just somebody to get to know, although it certainly goes there too. But they need to really have a, a personal, transformational, saving encounter with Jesus Christ. And the church is the Lord's plan A to get that word out. And so we won't be praying in our prayer time, yes, for physical things, Yes, for the nation, and as we pray for the nation, also for our immediate community and the lost souls that are around us. And so we want to lift them up to the Lord when we do. So um, we will engage with that in the month of October as a, as a rolling event that occurs once a month. We're not gonna we're not gonna uh, make a big sermon out of the time we meet, but expect um, to be invited after church to a prayer meet. Essentially, mark it down, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to that. We've got uh, some classics to sing, praise to the Lord from this morning. Uh, it, did we get worship guides, brother? We did, not. we did not? Well, ain't it a mystery what we're going to be singing? Y'all are looking at us going, what have they done to us today? We've got some, uh, we've got some familiars for sure. Um, this, in my opinion, is one of the greatest hymns ever written by, by a hymn writer. It's a short, quick one, and it, it is, uh, On Christ the solid rock I stand, no, all other ground is sinking sand. One of the greatest hymns. So if you'll stand and sing just the first couple of songs, we've got some uh, praise to offer to the Lord. We'll pray as we do. Heavenly Father, you are worthy of our praise. You are on the throne in heaven right now. All the creatures in heaven cry out, Holy, 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 as the Lord God Almighty. At the center of worship up there is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who made His entrance into our place here on the earth and did what no other could do. Lived and died and rose in a way that He would become for us the solid rock of our salvation. We take our stand on Him. We hope in Him. And we'll see Him one day. Amen.
kind of like growing up back in time in a way, um, if you've ever been there. And these songs we'll do now sort of run together, and they're beautiful, uh, but they're pretty country, so I uh, need you to jump in and help us out. Um, let me get this uh, properly set before me. We have, uh, in, in the church where I grew up, these would come up every now and then, and sometimes the people would clap, sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes they would just kind of hum along. I want you to sing good and loud because this is really at the top of your pastor's range. And so uh, I'll, enjoy, <laughs> I'll enjoy hearing my brothers and sisters in the Lord over myself. Uh, but these two, um, Deuteronomy 33, 27. You weren't, you weren't told to memorize that one probably if you, were grow, if you grew up in a scripture memorization program. But it says, it says, the Lord God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. The everlasting arms. And so uh, he's held you when you didn't know you were being held. He holds you today. And so we'll sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessing is What a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Here we go. And though how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how right the path. Rose from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, 
leaning on the everlasting arms it is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I put Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. And oh, how sweet. To trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me with the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. And I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. You believe that? And I need more grace to trust him. I know that that is certainly true. Lord, give me the grace to trust you more. Well, church family, let's be seated. Uh, in view of how things are, I am comfortable with offering plates going around. Uh, we didn't exactly discuss that with ushers, so... If we could just have maybe two brothers who will just walk the aisle, look on each side, and if you have an offering for the Lord today, a tithe or offering for him, uh, this will certainly uh, bring a blessing back upon you. I love the flexibility of Hobbs Island Church. If one of y'all will come up here and take this out of my hand. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Okay. As Roy and Pat are going about that, we've got a familiar one it's um in my opinion kind of like the the exclamation mark of contemporary christian music the song how great is our god and so uh, this one really set the bar it's been with us since our youth group days so if you're familiar with it just uh, sing it along close your eyes maybe go to the lord in prayer with this one uh this is a king in splendor and robed in majesty worthy of our praises.
Joe, by the way, is on the stage, and you're probably looking at it in wonderment. Why is that there? You know, some congregations in these parts have a box of uh, uh, reptiles up in the front, and when when a bold brother is in the spirit, he'll just go up and take the intimidating beast and in faith. And uh, just see what the Lord will do. And if any of you are so overcome and are not so scared of the banjo, I know that's not part of the closing of the Gospel of Mark. It doesn't say they shall pick up stringed instruments. But, um, you know, by faith, what all have we conquered? We may be bringing the banjo in uh, future uh, times. It's... uh, probably the happiest of all stringed instruments, really. You know, that just has a voice to it that uh, I think only the Lord, uh, <laughs> I think he, when he gave us the banjo, it's kind of like when he gave us the puppy dog. They're going to love this one. That's what he said. Let's see. Am I even live? Let me go. Ah! Thank you. We're going to take a break after this Sunday from the book of 1 John. But we're going to be there today. We're going to go for the month of October into a series called The Wisdom We Need for Foolish Times. And uh, if you're interested in that, invite a friend. Invite a friend who you think might need a little toast of wisdom. And we will uh, pick up where we left off in the book of Ecclesiastes many months ago in June. I haven't touched that book since then. But in 1 John 2, this is an interesting text. In the Pew Bible, if you want to follow along, I'll kind of reference, you know, sort of the location of a word on the page. But it picks up on page 1021 if you want to, if you want to follow with the Pew Bible. All right. When you're raising children, or even if you've never had children, or if you can't remember what it was like to have children, how could we forget? You have to warn them of danger as often as danger presents itself, don't you? You have to warn them of the need to not play in the street. Millie Lou, we sit her down in front of the house, the, the whatever you call it, sidewalk from the house to the driveway is rather long and from the house to the mailbox is rather short. She options for the street every time if you don't coax her along. Children often don't know the risks that are entailed in the moment. And it shows. As a young man, there are many injuries I sustained to myself of my own doing. And guess who did not consider the risks? Walked away hobbling from a lot of silly stunts on bikes and skateboards and stuff like that. Spiritual risks are a lot worse, really, than physical risks, and John is going to point a few of them out. And he begins in verse 18 with that familiar expression, the way he loves to talk to his readers. Remember, he was a pastor, not a, he wasn't a mystic sitting off on the sidelines just kind of throwing out literature. He was a pastor. And so he knows these people. When he wrote these words down, he had names and faces to go with the, with the word children. But again, in verse 18, He says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. 
Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. We need to read on. Although that verse gives us so much to chew on for just one sermon. Verse 19, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are all are not of us. <laughs> but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Now here we go. Verse 22. Pulls the gloves off. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is taught you, abide in Him. Boy, if you took that from the top to bottom, boy, you got a lot to think about right there. He begins with this, you know, he moves off this section that's a little, a little clearer to us, I think, because back in, in verses 15 through 17, he comes at us with, do not love the world. If you love the things in the world, then you're not loving the Father. And then he moves on to this, and he brings up this, guy, this person in Scripture in verse 18, that when we hear about this person, are, and especially in America and, and, and especially in recent times, our antenna shoots up. We hear the word antichrist. And there's been a lot of speculation about who this is because the truth of the matter is, according to John, according to Jesus, according to all the Bible writers, in the end of days, there will come someone who is so charismatic and influential and world famous that he can kind of consolidate world rule and attract the nations and the peoples and all of these all of these failed leaders will sort of be shoved out of the way and he will not only present himself as a qualified national leader but he'll present himself as as god no less and this comes and, and if you if you're familiar with the, uh, the Left Behind books, this is, this is popularized through those movies and those books. And, and uh, you know, they, of course, had, had a, you know, wrote ahead and kind of made a script to go with it and had a guy who presented as the Antichrist in that storyline. But can you imagine in the day and age where something can happen in China, something can happen in Russia or Japan, and we know about it in minutes, right? How, how much time do you think lapsed from the suicide bombing at the Kabul airport till we learned of it? Not a lot. Well, God rules over the times. Technology and media and communication are under His control. He's, he's, he's in charge at the top of what we develop. And, and His Word, seeing into the future, tells us there will come one who will deceive the nations. But John doesn't give us that much detail here where we find ourselves today. John is not concerned with a top-to-bottom definition of who the Antichrist is in this passage. But we often get overtly concerned with it. Let me tell you, it's been everybody from back in the early days of the church. It was the Emperor Nero. And if you want to talk about a bad leader, Nero was some piece of work. Uh, I don't even know if... if if the electorate of the United States of America would vote for Nero, and that's saying something. We're giving a lot of slack in this country to unqualified people here lately. But Nero was an entertainer, a people pleaser, a narcissist. And so what he would do with professing Christians when the tide turned against him popularly is he would scapegoat the blame onto them for the decline of Rome's fortunes and circumstances 
And he would even use, it is, it is historically recorded, the burning bodies of Christians as torchlight at festivals. Well, you could see how someone like that might really register high with the identity of the Antichrist. There's also been, of course, speculation that whoever uh, Hitler has been up there, whoever has been in charge of Russia has been speculated. Saddam Hussein was thought to be, he had ambitions to sort of resurrect this glory Babylon empire type of thing. And just about, it's funny, I have to say, just about every time we get into a presidential race, whoever the church, whoever most Christians don't like, we speculate, is that him? He's obviously not in world power now. I don't think it helped Barack Obama's case that the day he was inaugurated, so I'm told, that the lottery numbers in his home state were 666. I'm going to be a fair player here. Ronald Reagan was speculated because of his three names having six letters apiece. Because Scripture says the number of the beast is 666. And why on earth, Ronald Reagan, did you retire to 666 St. Clair Avenue? So both Republican and Democrat have had their fair shot of accusation. But what John wants you to understand is this. Not that we need to be overtly concerned at the moment with just who the figurehead is, because that will come more in time with the future tribulation and judgment upon the world. We need to be concerned with the fact that the spirit of the one who opposes Jesus Christ is present in certain people. And this is just a good question. How long do you think it took? How long do you think it took from the beginning of Bib- of, of the ministry of the gospel, of the ministry of the apostles? How long did it take for the church to be filled with false doctrine? Pretty much right off the bat. I mean, verse, verse 26, he says, I write about those who are trying to deceive you. Now, he doesn't give us the details of just what sort of other teachings were going around in this time, but we can imagine that had something to do with denying who Jesus is. Something to do with taking this person, Jesus, and not taking him to be who he says he, who he, says he is. Because he says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? There's more than one way to use a pocket knife. There we go. Staying on my page. No one who denies the Son has the Father, he said in verse 23. Some people then were denying something about Jesus. Well, that really makes me want to go back to the beginning. That in verse 24 he says, let what you heard from the beginning abide, meaning live, animate your life, get in you and, and give you purpose and give you vision. Let it abide in you, what you heard from the beginning. Well, what on earth was that? Friends, what John is referring to here is what we believe from Scripture to be plainly true about our Savior. We just sang of Him. We just said, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.'" Have you ever heard of anyone like Jesus? In the best case scenario, me as your pastor, I would, my voice and my worst quirks would disappear behind this plain sense vision and teaching of Jesus. I don't want you to walk away from church on a Sunday morning and say, boy, brother Jesse, boy, brother Jesse, boy, brother Jesse. You know, sometimes you might go there, but I want you to say, oh, what a Savior we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a... What a king we anticipate coming one day. I don't want you to say, wow, the pastor really was lit up now. Just see Jesus. The best compliment you can give a pastor is, brother, you disappeared today and we saw Jesus, only Jesus. Well, who is this Jesus? Because if one comes who is the Antichrist, it's good to have clear who is the Christ. Who do you who is he anti? Who is he against? Who is he opposed to? Quite frankly, he's opposed to the creator of the universe, the one who sustains it and upholds it, the one who was there in the beginning as the very Word of God. And he is opposed to this one who is called in Hebrews the author and the finisher, the founder and perfecter of our faith. I want to take that word author for a minute. I want to track with you. Now, you folks, I don't know how you will answer this, but when's the last time you read a novel? Can you think back on maybe it was last week or maybe it was last year or maybe it's been a long time? We're not in a long reading era anymore. The novel came in about 200 years ago. 
and it seems that the attention span shortened generation has sort of gotten weak on that front. But an author begins authoring with the end in mind. You see. The greatest series of, of fiction have been written really not making it up as they go, but with the conclusion already in view and you set it out there from the beginning. God is writing a true story to the very end of days. John said this is the last hour. This is the last period we could take it. It means not so much that when John wrote that, 60 minutes later the world was going to end. Take your Bible literally, but understand the sense of the word hour, meaning this is the last period. The next thing that changes, oh, it changes big. Because it has to do with us meeting with the Lord face to face. But God has written the story from beginning to end. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word is... All through your Old Testament period is, is, is pointed to. He's pointed to. It's almost like they're, the prophets are given this, this vision of one they know. He, he's, got, he's got to come and He's got to fill this description. He's got to come and He's got to be the seed of the woman. He's got to be, according to Isaiah 7.14, the one the virgin will conceive and bear a son. Well, He's got to come and He's got to be this one who will in some way carry our sins and bear our iniquities upon Him was the punishment that brought us peace out of also the prophet Isaiah. Because the people in God's story chose to try to become the authors for themselves, and that includes all of us. We chose to try to get in the way of the goodness of God and instead assume that we know better, we will have better, we will be the makers of our own destiny so Satan said, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Take from the fruit of the tree. And what did God do? Prophecies unloaded on us. I'm going to get the serpent. It's going to happen. God doesn't pull Himself away from us. God comes closer eventually. Because the way that God writes Himself back into this broken story is by being born as a baby in a manger, in Bethlehem. Merry Christmas. And He is this, and that this child is there, and, and in Him is all of God and all of man all together. It's not half God and half man. He's whole and whole, and He grows up and He never sins, and it says in the Gospel of Luke that He grew and became strong and increased in wisdom with favor in God, with God and among men. And He's this just this perfect child, and His Earthly parents had to wonder at all that He was. Mary, from the beginning, was treasuring things up in her heart. And He lives on in this humble state, obscure. God is on earth and He is obscure for 30 years. If you ever feel like God ain't doing much with you because you ain't well known, some of you don't want to be well known. It's probably best. I'm not saying negative for you. I'm saying the <laughs> friendship with the world is enmity with God. Some of you just want to keep it small. Keep, keep things close to, close to home. Jesus for 30 years walks in the trade of Joseph a carpenter. Just as God at the beginning is a maker, God the Son on the earth is a maker, and He just humbly submits to Joseph. And He goes through all the religious instruction of the boys in His day. He is in the synagogue. He goes to the feasts and the festivals. We remember the story where He's He's uh, left three days over in Jerusalem near the temple. He's inquisitive and he's impressing all the scholars and teachers. But all those years, he was humble, submissive. And this is, the, this is the big one. He was without sin. I don't know how old I was when I committed my first sin. See, that's the thing. I can't remember it. But it happened. Jesus knew no sin. And then when the time was right and he knew that it was the Father's will, he steps out in public ministry and says the kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news, the Gospel. He submits to the baptism of John, the forerunner, who was there to prepare the way for the Lord according to the prophecy 
Malachi. So he's baptized. He comes up and the Father says, My son, hear whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And Jesus goes on to overcome Satan in the wilderness. He goes on to call His disciples. He goes on to do many miracles and many signs, many wonders. And His teaching confounds all of His opponents. You can't catch Him with your words. They couldn't prove Him wrong and discredit His claim to be what no man had claimed to be. The Son of Man. The Son of God. The one worthy of worship. You know, Jesus never rejected worship when someone came to offer worship. It would be appropriate for us to reject worship. A despot accepts worship unless he is truly divine. Jesus could accept true worship. And so, all of these steps, all of this way, from the beginning of the story, God had written out a cross for His Son, Jesus Christ, and Jesus would go there willingly lay down His life, bearing our sin and our shame and our evil. I would shudder to think if God were to ever open the books on every wrong I had ever done, yet Jesus took it on. Jesus paid it all. In the span of a few short hours on that cross, yet suffering, He bled and died. And then He did something that I don't think the average Joe can claim to do. He walks out of the tomb and he goes right off to tell his followers baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. These disciples you're going to make. And teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. And he intends for that commission to be encompassing of the whole world. Who else in your life is doing that much? Who else in your life is claiming that much? Who else in our life has the audacity to say, my words are your first words to learn. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. I will have to apologize to my wife, our children, over the course of my days for many errors in my parenting and in my living. Jesus can be trusted in all matters. They've tried to discredit His Bible. They can't. They've tried to disprove His divinity. They can't. They've come in as the Antichrist spirit in the church and outside of the church, and they can't disprove what the Lord has said or done. Well, in verse 18, of course, John has warned them, many Antichrists have come, those opposing the Lord in their spiritual demeanor and in their words and their actions. But these were within the church. These were within the congregation. These who eventually began to oppose Christ. Just like Jesus said, the wheat and the chaff will grow together until in the end the Father will separate them. We're a small church. May the Lord forbid that there's any chaff among us. How do you know? They went out from us because they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. He's speaking of people in the day who broke faith with the church, not struggling to attend, not getting worldly busy, not a job that they got, not, not something, with, but losing the desire to maintain fellowship with the, with the believers. They left, whoever they were. That can happen, and it does happen in this day and age. It's happened all throughout the history of God's church. People have been in it, who eventually in time, when things heat up, when life gets hard, when ministry gets tough, they fall away. How many people will not come back to worship the Lord in a congregational setting post-COVID-19? Are they spirit of the Antichrist? Or are they just following into the lazy American handling of religion? When, when to be born in, in, in a state like Alabama carried with it, I mean, you could, you could throw a rock in each direction and hit a Republican and a Baptist, probably the same person. I mean, you know, just really. <laughs> but what is that identity now? What, what does that mean for the person who goes solo? I just want to call all people to come and enjoy this. Come and stand in the light with us. But these are people who are going out and they are not just merely physically distancing from the church, they are denying the very Savior 
we just considered. They're denying him. They're, they will do it this way in these days. You know, Jesus may be good for you, but Jesus is one of many. Friend, you'll meet wonderful people who don't believe in Jesus. It, it, as far as humanly speaking, they could be hardworking, they could be fantastic neighbors, they could be excellent citizens. And, and, and you know what? If they, if they once claimed to have Christ, and yet now they deny Him, they're walking dangerously in line with the Spirit that will manifest in the end of days in the Antichrist. It doesn't mean they are that, capital A, Antichrist, but they are spiritually more attuned to Him than to Christ. Because they would deny something about Jesus' claims. Now, I don't think we have many here who are struggling to accept that Jesus was born of a virgin or that He rose from the dead. If you're struggling with that, I would, I, I'll converse with you about it and I, and I won't do so at height and volume, but I, I guarantee you this, you wouldn't be the first who struggled with that. And there are good resources spiritually to come through that kind of questioning about God. Because in verse 20, you are anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. Anointed here, we hear that word. Now, I don't. how many times as your pastor have I come right up to you and said, brother or sister, you look pretty anointed today. You are anointed and you know it. I haven't used that language on you much, and, that, and yet it's biblical language in this sense. The anointing of old was the pouring out of olive oil on the head of one who would be the priest or a king in Israel. All throughout the Old Testament, when the anointing happens, it represents this, this it physically represents this pouring out of the Spirit of God upon someone for a special task or purpose. And the Lord says, you are anointed. Now, whether you've ever had oil placed on your head or not, what He's referring to is that you have a deposit of the Holy Spirit. It's called in verse 20, the Holy One. That is what He is called here. You have internally obtained the anointing, meaning the true eternal oil of God's blessing is already poured out in you, and it is Him. So you have the capacity to know. You have the capacity to walk through your doubts and walk through your pain and walk through your trouble and rest on Jesus, only Jesus. Okay? And so those who come into the fold but never have really taken on Christ, maybe they're here because it's socially right or they're here because it's friends or they're here because maybe it's a job. And then they go off and they deny Jesus these these are to be lamented and warned against. What on earth would we do, guys, if somebody from among us were to say, I don't really believe Jesus rose from the grave after all. What if they would say that? Whew. Yeah, we have no hope. Who, who are we calling on if we call on a man still buried and dead? Hey, we have to tenderly address that kind of thing. If that ever were to come up, you have to tenderly take this person and suggest, hey, listen, it's not just a concept. I'm not just wanting you to agree with this box you check. I'm actually telling you, this person has really done a number on me. And I love him. I don't pray to a dead man. I don't pray to some disembodied man who passed from earth to spiritual state never to come back. I pray to one who is risen, ascended, and reigning. And he's both lion and lamb. He is that royal one with the charge and the power and the ferocity of the lion. He is the tender one and the gentle one, the meek one like the lamb. He is all infinite and personal. I'm, I'm praying to that one. I am living in the pattern of that one. But if someone were to continue in that, then... This passage indicts that, that lack of faith in no uncertain terms. We don't want to call people a liar today, do we? And, when, and, and listen, <laughs> when, when you get lied to in, in some way, okay, so a politician, we'll just, you know, they're easy to pick on. We'll just do that. So um, 
Pray for your politicians. But anyway, when they lie and get caught, right, and, get, they, and I mean really get caught, if they do say anything about it, oh, I misspoke. I told a, I told a half-truth. I told an untruth. Huh. If that language, oh man, if, if that language were to become commonplace in the body of Christ, so help us. There's truth and there's lies. Be careful what you're discerning. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. The key question that I want to give you kind of as we go to the end of this that really John has in mind over this whole entire text. Because I haven't preached this thing verse by verse. I've sort of preached the sense of it. And I meant to do that. But the key question that I believe John might have had in mind, that at least it's in my mind. It goes back to Mark 8, 27. It'd be a good idea to read that. Well, that was a nice knife. When you go to Mark 8, 27, the conversation begins between Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus went on with His disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. This is Gentile country. This is not, this is not a proper Jewish influence in the region. And on the way, He asked His disciples, who do people say that I am? They left it open at that. I imagine that just as when you ask a question to a group of students of any age, sometimes you can just hear a pin drop. They all get so quiet. But in this case, the answers start to fly. Because they've been hearing it. Verse 28, people, people thought, they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. Friends, Islam still carries that last answer today. In verse 29, and he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. When he said the Christ, he wasn't saying that's your last name. He was saying that's, that's the title and the function and the role in God's story that you fulfill. The Christ. And that literally means the anointed one. You have to share in the anointing of the Holy Spirit to understand who the anointed one, Jesus, is. And John wrote, no one who denies the Son has the Father. There are people today who are very comfortable to say we want the same God. I think in a way we might want the same things out of God. For good or bad. But if you don't want Jesus... We don't want the same God. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. In verse 29, back in Mark 8, Peter said, You are the Christ. Now he wanted them to remain quiet. In verse 30, he charged them to tell no one about Him. Time would come when this sort of information would be public and, and, and free, but if, if it were to be kind of loud spoken at that time, they would have rushed him into some sort of political conquering movement that he wasn't interested in. But in another Gospel text, he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You all have knowledge, John wrote in this text. Why? If you are saved, dear brother or sister, you are on the inside track of knowing Jesus personally. Have you been walking with Him this week then? Let's bring it home. How has your walk been with the Lord this week? How has your, how has your fellowship with Him been? Is it real? Is it tangible? Is it felt? Is it known? Is it experienced? Are you, are you in the light of truth that comes from Him? I want to give you a few applications. First off, consider whether you uh, bear the mark of a deceiver or a disciple. 
the deceivers are those who have the Antichrist spirit. They point to Him as uh, the one to come toward the end of days. They signify that the world will eventually give to this leader in its final moments more authority than is due any man. The deceivers foreshadow the Antichrist. They forsake the fellowship, meaning not just that they came under hardship and hard times and we need to go be checking on them, but they say this. They say this kind of thing. They say, there's no good church ever, period. Jesus is not who you think He is. And they do it in some ways that have been crazy. Remember Jim Jones in the People's Temple? Relocated to Guyana. 800 people committed suicide under him. He was claiming to be somebody and know something. He didn't know it. I ain't trying to be ugly. They make good neighbors. But Joseph Smith said that an angel named Moroni paid him a visit. Hebrews says that in the last days God has spoken to us by His Son. I'm settled on Jesus. I'm not looking for another angel. Now, precious people across the face of the earth believe that Jesus is limited to the role of a prophet and that the Scriptures were corrupted all because a war leader named Muhammad said so. God is graciously visiting the world of Islam through many dreams and signs. And people are seeing Jesus for who He is. Go look at the testimony of Nabil Qureshi. He was an Islamic, faithful Muslim man, born again because he just prayed a simple prayer. He said, if you are who you say you are, Jesus, show me. And then hear the dream that he had and the way that the dear brother in college shared the Word of God with him. Because God loves these people. These aren't targets to be pummeled. These are people to be prayed for. But they're also not in the fellowship of the Lord's church. And so pray for them all the more. And the people follow after lies. That's part of the spirit of the deceiver. In 2 Timothy 3.10, Paul wrote, he said, You have observed my teaching and my conduct and my purpose and my faith and my patience, my love, my perseverance, my sufferings that came upon me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Then he says this, he says, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Often the the thing is that the lie is safer than staying the course. But then he says, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now there are characteristics of the disciples. They confess Christ as the Son of the Father. We got that from the text and from the conversation back when Jesus asked His followers, who do men say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's an important role that explains all of Scripture coming to the point. You don't have a Bible that makes sense without a Christ that is the Son of God. They continue in fellowship with the church. Did you know that people need to be reminded of that? Right? Hebrews 10.25 Do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Some are in the habit of doing. Why would that be in the Bible if it were not possible for us to lose the fellowship? The fellowship of the church doesn't save you. The fellowship of the church is where God can do great things through His Word, through His people to bless you and disciple you. Make you like Jesus. And then they conserve the truth of God's Word, the true disciples do. They don't move on past what God has spoken. Oftentimes what it is is a restless soul gets really angsty because they're bored with the Bible and they got to move on to something new and exciting and to them it seems better. Oh, the Bible is where it, the Bible is where it is. That is where. It is consistently new and making me new and it is consistently exciting. And if it doesn't feel that way, the problem is with my eyes, not with the Word itself. Well, continue in Scripture as you consider that John, who has called himself the Apostle of Love, would use this kind of language to describe some people. 
treat others with immense grace and charity and patience. Because let's remember the phrase, but for the grace of God, there go I. Okay? And so it has been the mark of many a church that believes the Bible top to bottom on the right doctrinal checkpoints to speak in such a way that is not so much invitational as it is purely only ever confrontational. There's a time for confrontation. But we are primarily a people of an invitation. We are not heresy hunters out there blasting Facebook with, look who said this today. Look who did. We're not primarily this. We are rather remembering Jesus said, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Form your life in a healthy, proper proportion, more like a family and not like a cult around the body of Christ. It's a family. It's a body. You know, I hope that helped you this morning. I hope that you know that there's been no one in history quite like Jesus who has been the subject of so much speculation and controversy and debate down to the very present day. And that says something about Him. He is not someone that we can easily ignore. He's not someone we can walk right past much like other people. So if you see somebody who is making profound claims about him or herself, saying, I've resurrected from the grave nine times. Can I get you to a doctor? Okay. But the sort of life and the sort of man and the sort of person and the sort of claims that Jesus brings to us from Scripture, you can't walk right past them. You've got to deal with this one, this one with whom we have to do. Scripture indicts us in our sin, but it dignifies us in our being made in God's image, and it calls us to reconcile with our loving Heavenly Father through the sacrifice of His dear Son and His resurrection for us. You got that? Don't worry about no Antichrist. He can't touch you. He can't do anything to you. You'll be okay. I want to pray for you. We have a song that will lead you through a new one. I'd like to just bow your head and close your eyes. Ah, Lord God Almighty, in these times in which we live, I could have been up here, God, pointing out a dozen famous errors about how Jesus is misunderstood today. That would have, that would have taken more than the sermon. But I'd like to point Jesus out as the one worthy of our attention and our devotion. God, can we just settle on Him? God, can we say, like we said earlier, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His Word. Can we be a people of the book, a people of Scripture? Feed our souls, Lord, through Your Word. Illuminate what is written through the Holy Spirit. Now God, if someone here today has any anxiety about his or her standing when it comes to Jesus, there are clear lines I pray that they understand. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And then He said, abide in me and I in you, and if you so do, you'll bear much fruit and prove to be my disciple. We want to be proven to be disciples. If someone here today doesn't quite know what it means to be a disciple, a follower, a believer, to be saved, Lord, let them consider this simple prayer as their own. O oh God, according to the mercy of Your dear Son, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for me, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. Let them take that for themselves. The offer stands. Thank you. Amen. All right. We have a new song, uh, for this, new for this church anyway. It's a take on the uh, popular doxology, which you have uh, sung before. It goes, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. But it adds some uh, chorus to it. So we're going to sing this together in closing.
if God has done a work in you, then you need to share with us, uh, with me, uh, with anyone you trust in here. Please do that before you leave today. But would you stand and just do this new song with us? You'll catch on to it very quickly. like that new one i loved it been wanting to sing it here for a long time and so uh we'll feature it more and more well church family do this um plan to be there tonight at five with something delicious uh up at the vision pavilion it is not pork chops and it's not at the parsonage so none of that information is worthy yeah you can usually trust what's on that screen but this is human error right here so uh yeah we will do roast and uh you just who, who do we report our food to like you know is there a point person or are we just all hoping we don't bring the same thing if we bring the same thing we can we can decide who's the best be like five loaves and two fish so you know quite like that uh well friends if you could be there at five that'd be fantastic and uh, if you're not uh, occupied on wednesday evening and you want an extra blessing with a word our brother donald barnes is always uh, bringing a, a good message and uh, yes, yes, brother, your, your finger's up. So just so everybody's reminded, we started with the visit of the angel to Mary this Wednesday night. 
how exciting. There's no, there's nothing quite like getting uh, into those Christmas sections at a time when you're not all decked the halls and you can just look at the word closely for what it is. And it makes Christmas all the better. So uh, Donald is a wonderful teacher. Friends, uh, we will look forward to seeing you at any of those times. You're, you're just a blessing to be with this Sunday. Hope you had a sweet time here. Hope the Lord blessed you in a special way. You are dismissed. Got a little jam for them. Got a little jam for them.